Good morning. Good morning to good morning. It's good to be here this morning and it's good to worship the Lord. We're in uh, hymn number, our song number 161. We'll stand together to sing in our call to worship, Psalm 89, verse 1. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, indeed, we want to sing of your mercies. We want to give you the glory this day for all that you've done for us in and through your Son, Jesus Christ. We look to you and we thank you. And we want you to have the glory. We want you to be pleased in all that we think and all that we say and do this day. Bless this service and speak to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just remain standing. We're going to go over to sing King of Love, My Shepherd Is. This is a newer rendition of this song. I have to remember how it goes. <laughs> and you're in, oh, we're in the wrong key. Hold on. The king of 
seated. Such a wonderful thought that goodness and mercy of the Lord follow us as we follow the Lord and uh, goodness and mercy will pursue us all the days of our life forever until we're in the Lord's house with him. Isn't it wonderful that this morning together as a family we can bow our hearts and our heads together collectively and address our Heavenly Father. Please pray with me as I lead us. Dear Father in heaven, today is the Lord's day, and we are the Lord's people because we were chosen according to your foreknowledge and by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit to obey Jesus and to be sprinkled with his blood. Before coming to faith in the Lord Jesus, to our shame, we turned each one to our own way in disobedience. Oh, how foolish we were. But by your grace, we have been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb of God. We have been made part of your family through adoption and have you as our heavenly Father. And now we can walk humbly with you and our deepest desire is to please you always. Dear Father, teach us to reverence you and to worship your name. Teach us to walk in your ways. Teach us to practice the habits that make us conform to the image of Christ. Shower your blessings upon us as we seek justice and to do good. Teach us to shun evil and to live pure lives. Teach us to follow Jesus as devoted disciples. Bless the work of our hands. Let us eat the fruit of our labor with joy and let it be well with us. Bless our homes and our families. Let our children grow up like olive shoots around us. Bless your church. Let us be active in making disciples. Let us be effective as the light of the world and as the salt of the earth. Let us be lively in spreading the fragrance, the sweet fragrance of Jesus in a dark world, in a crooked and perverse generation. We acknowledge that all our good and all our provisions and all we need come from you and you alone. The satisfaction and joy we have come from you. Peace is your gift to us and oh, how blessed we are. We exalt you and praise you. We glorify you and magnify your holy name. With grateful hearts, we thank you for answering our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book gave it back to the attendant and sat down. 
And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman, the Syrian. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. And they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went his way. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together to sing before the throne of God above. Amen. 
You may be seated. The children may make their way down to Sunday school as well. I know his name is not familiar, but uh, Thomas, <clears throat> Thomas Wolfe published a book in 1934, and it was called You Can't Go Home Again. It's a novel, a fictitious story, and it's about a character by the name of George Weber who wrote a novel about the hometown that he grew up in, and it became a fabulous success, and he thought that when he went home to his hometown that he would go home to a hero's welcome. <laughs> he was shocked to find that he only felt, found hate and disgust because everybody thought that they revealed their secrets in the book and uh, they forced him to leave and so he could never go home again. Now, the reason I'm telling you that story is I don't know where he got the idea of writing that book, but uh, Jesus has a very similar experience. Uh, this morning we're gonna look at Mark chapter six where Jesus goes home to Nazareth after a very long and successful ministry, successful in the, in the human sense, uh, that there were crowds everywhere. Uh, we read that, uh, for example, uh, the crowds were so great that uh, the people couldn't even get to the door. They had to go up into the roof and come through the roof. And crowds were coming at night uh, in the evening to get healed. And everywhere he went, the crowds were always all, uh, uh, at him. Uh, when he got off the boat, uh, there were crowds around him again and Jairus and so on. So he has this tremendous ministry. And so now he's going to go back home to Nazareth. And will he receive a hero's welcome? Well, John has read for us the text out of Luke, which is much longer and gives us many more details. So I'm going to be referring to some of the things that uh, John read for us. But we're going to look at it from Mark chapter 6, verses 1 to 6. And so if you have your Bibles, uh, if not, you can just on your phone. That's the nice thing about these phones nowadays. You can have 50 different English translation at your fingertips, and you can even read it in Greek if you would like, because uh, there, there's, it's all there. It's all available to us. All right. Uh, Mark 6, verses 1 to 6. Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue and the many listeners were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him, and such miracles as these performed by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joses and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and his own household. And he could not do mir uh, he, he, I'm sorry, and he could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief, and he was going around the villages and teaching. Before I actually get in to look at the text, I would like us to give a, a bit of background about this. And I've discovered, my daughter told me this, she said, Dad, you just care more about them learning than they care about learning. <laughs> so forgive me if I give you more information than you want to know. But Mark chapter 6, as soon as we read this, and we read about Jesus going to his hometown and his family and the reaction that he gets, I hope immediately into your mind springs chapter 3. Because if we go back to chapter 3, we see that in verse uh, 21 that, uh, first of all, in verse 20, Jesus was so busy at the door that he couldn't even have time to eat. And this gets back to them in Nazareth. And in 21, his own people heard of this, and they went out to take custody of him, for they said... He's nuts. He's out of his senses. He's gone crazy. And they're going there to protect Jesus, to take him away for his benefit. They're going to try to bind him and to stop him. So that's, the, if you remember correctly, that's the first part of Mark's very first sandwich. He gives a piece of bread. 
He closes with a piece of bread, and in the middle is the piece of meat. So he talks about the family in verse 21. In verse 31, he's going to talk about the family again. So his mother and his brothers are outside the door of the house where Jesus is teaching. Now this is important that we understand they are outside, because it says it twice that they are outside. And Jesus is told, your mother and your brothers are outside the house. And he says in verse 33, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who are sitting around him, that's inside the house, the insiders. Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my mother, my brother, and my sister. And so Jesus sets up the insider-outsider relationship. If you're an insider, it has nothing to do with blood relationship to Jesus. Mary, the brothers, the sisters were not insiders because they were related to Jesus. What relates you to Jesus is your faith. The disciples were his real family. In chapter 4, uh, verse 11, after he gives the parable of the four soils, uh, they, the disciples uh, are insiders, but they're still a little ignorant. They don't know what Jesus is really here for and so they ask him about it and he says to you has been given the mysteries of the kingdom of God but those who are outside those people without faith everything is in parables so in the middle the meat part which explains what this is all about we have the uh, the Pharisees and the scribes who have come down from Jerusalem and they're on a mission they know that Jesus has done all of these miraculous things, but they've come to bind him, to stop him, to, to have him just, just completely stop in his tracks. And they said, of course he's doing these things, but he has sold himself out to Satan because, in verse 22, he is possessed of Beelzebul. He casts out demons by the ruler of demons. So the family was trying to bind him for his own benefit because they thought he was crazy. The Pharisees and the scribes are trying to bind him because they think he has sold his soul out to Satan and is deceiving everybody and is going to drag them into hell. But Jesus cannot be bound. Jesus did not come to be bound. He came to bind. And this is very, very key to the whole gospel story. Verse 27. But no one can enter the strong man's house to plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man. That's Satan. He's got to beat Satan and tie him up. Wrap him up, as it were, in duct tape or, or those chains so that Satan is powerless. And then he can release people from the bondage of Satan. If we go to chapter 5, we see a perfect illustration of this. The man who is filled with the unclean spirits, there's at least 6,000 of them because he's called Legion. And as soon as Jesus walks onto the shore, steps out of the boat, immediately this man with these demons comes running down and falls at Christ's knees. And he commands the unclean spirits to go out, and they go out. And then it says in verse 15, this is when the people from the town come back, they observed that the man who had been demon-possessed, sitting down, clothed, and in his right mind, the very man who had had legion, and they became frightened. So here we see what, what uh, Mark is saying in chapter three, that Jesus is the one who has come to bind Satan and to release people. So that is what connects this to chapter 6. So if we go back from the story in chapter 3, just one step backwards, what do we find is Jesus chooses his 12 apostles. Uh, that's chapter 3, verse 13 uh, to 19. So if we go forward from chapter 6, what do we find? we find that Mark balances that story with Jesus sending the 12 out on that first missionary journey. That's chapter 6, verses 7 to 13. So if we go back one more step in chapter 3, what do we find? We find that the disciples are acting as crowd control because the crowd is pressing in on Jesus and he asks them to keep the crowd away and so he goes into the boat. If we go forward from the sending out of the 12, what do we find? That the disciples are now in the crowd that's very orderly, the 5,000, and they're being fed. So you're going to hear the word now. Jesus, or Mark is setting up a chiasm. So I've showed you the outside part. What's in the center of the chiasm? 
What's in the middle? What, what hinges? It's chapters 4 and 5. That's in the very center. Jesus is teaching his disciples inside. He's giving them information. And then in 5, he's showing the power that he has as God to the disciples. He, quell, he stops the storm. He heals the demoniac, uh, uh, casts out the demons. He uh, uh, heals the woman with the blood issue, and he raises Jairus' daughter. That's in the very center. And it is faith that connects you to that Jesus. And so that's where we are in the story. And one more thing, just before we actually look at the text, um, I want to talk about Nazareth. Now, Nazareth is not named in Mark. It is named uh, in, um, uh, in, in Luke. Anybody ever heard of Nazareth? How many have ever been to Nazareth? Oh, we have one person that's gone to Nazareth. Isn't it great that Nazareth is now on the tourist maps? I, 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 I was in Israel, I have to say this, I was in Israel for 14 days, and uh, my guided tour did not take me to Nazareth. We just went by it. I'm kind of sorry we didn't go and see it. Uh, the reason we didn't go and see it, because there's really nothing there uh, except the fact that Jesus grew up there. Uh, you, we should not be surprised... Nazareth does not appear anywhere in the Old Testament. There's absolutely no one who wrote about Nazareth before the Gospels. It doesn't appear in any rabbinic literature anywhere until the second century, 200 years after Christ's death. Somebody just in passing said, oh, by the way, Nazareth is where Jesus... And, uh, and, and so for another 100 years, it hardly ever shows up. It starts to show up in writings more in the 3rd century when the mother of Constantine, who quote, and then this is an, a quote, I don't believe it, became a Christian, and she went and she raised the monument in Nazareth saying this is the place. And so it's really a little tiny hick town, uh, forgotten, nobody knows about it. Had Jesus not been raised there, it would have never entered into history. Uh, it was about 500 people on a hill and uh, they sort of, it was sort of a flat spot on the hill. And people lived in the caves on the side of the hill. And uh, there, was, there was not a whole lot of, uh, to do up there. Uh, Nazareth is not famous for anything. Um, the, uh, the land where, where Nazareth was located was the land of Gentiles. And Matthew, it's called uh, Nazareth of the Gentiles. And um, it seems that Nazareth had a very bad reputation. I don't know why it had a bad reputation, uh, because um, in John 1 it says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I, I, I don't know why, why they thought it had a bad reputation, maybe because it was, it was unknown. Uh, Nazareth is also six kilometers southeast of Sephoris. Now, you've never heard of Sephoris. Has anybody here heard of Sephoris? I didn't think so, because you're not history uh, majors. Sephorus is actually the capital city of Galilee. Uh, when Herod Antipas was made king of the area, he built a brand new uh, capital city for himself, and it was called Sephorus. It's just down the hill uh, and uh, going north and a bit to the west of uh, Nazareth. And I believe that that's where Jesus spent most of his time working, uh, building that city for Herod Antipas. Uh, uh, the, the, the Israelites had Nazareth as part of Israel until 721 B.C. when Sennacherib, the, uh, the king of the Assyrians, came down with his army and uh, defeated Samaria and took all of the Israelites out of the north and he brought Gentiles, people from Assyria, to live there. And so it remained in Gentile hands until about 165 B.C. when the, uh, the Maccabeans started their revolt and kicked out the Greeks and, uh, and took over the area. And then they repopulated it with some uh, Jew, uh, Jews. But for the most part, the whole surrounding area is quite, uh, is quite uh, Gentile. So it's quite a mixed bag. And these people, uh, they're up in this uh, sort of this upcrop uh, on this hill. And, uh, and Jesus is there. He, he's called Jesus the Nazarene. Uh, the demoniac in chapter 1 uh, in the synagogue says, Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, Mark tells us that he comes from Nazareth. So, so that's this little city, little tiny village, uh, un uh, undescript. It would have never made the history pages had it not been that Jesus was raised there. And it isn't it great that that's where God, the eternal sovereign God, chose to grow up 
not in Rome, not in Jerusalem, but in this backwater, tiny little town. And, and so here we are. All right, so let's now look at the text. Uh, verse 1 and 2, the Nazarenes are shocked by his preaching, is, is, is the first thing. Look at verse 1 and 2. He went out from there and came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. When Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogues, and the many listeners were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom given to him and such miracles as performed by his hands? So the disciples are with Jesus. Now, this is key. This is key to the whole text. This is not just a throwaway comment. Oh, oh, by the way, yeah, the disciples followed. The disciples are Christ's true family, and his true family is going with him to where he was raised. They are the ones of faith. They are the ones who are the insiders. And we're going to see that as we go through this text, faith is the cardinal teaching of this text. Uh, do you have faith in Jesus? If so, how is it expressed? If you don't have faith, what comes out of your mouth? So the disciples are with Jesus. And uh, the reason I say they were shocked or stunned at his preaching is because of the, the verse uh, 2, when it says they were astonished. Uh, the Greek word for astonished is amazed. But, you know, amazed can be positive or negative. And I'll tell you a story. I won't tell you who it is. He was a friend. He's, he is a friend of mine. Uh, this happened uh, 50 years ago when his teenage daughter did something, said something that she shouldn't have done to her mother. And so he came in and he slapped her. And she said, I can phone the police on you. So he picked up the phone, call the police, but don't ever speak to your mother like that again. She was amazed at that slap, right? <laughs> Would you say she was amazed? <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is that amazement can have a positive effect. Like, oh, wow, you know, like, you know, if I do something that's, that's fantastic, I, I know I play for my own amazement, you know. <laughs> But also, amazement can have a negative uh, uh, connotation. And that's what this word connotates. It's negative. They were actually stunned, shocked by his preaching. Why? What was it about his preaching that shocked them? So let's go back to Luke uh, chapter 4 and, uh, and, and let us hear the, the preaching of Jesus in the synagogue. Now, by this time, Jesus is quite famous, and the synagogues were very casual uh, uh, services. They didn't run it as, as we have a, a pastor and Jeffrey, who's a song leader, and everything is organized. They were much more informal, and any visiting well-known speaker could be invited to speak. And so Jesus was not a rabbi. He was well-known as a teacher, and so they invited him to speak. And by God's choice, the man in charge of the Bible, the scrolls, gave to Jesus, because he chose the scrolls. It's not the speaker who chose it. Can you imagine? Just Here, preach from this. And he's got to unroll it. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so, and he gives him the scroll of Isaiah. So Jesus unrolls it uh, to chapter 61. And he reads verses 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, and has sent me to proclaim the release of the captives, and the recovery of the blind, and to set those who are oppressed, sorry, set free those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Now, I hope you appreciate the chiasm. I'm going to give you the chiasm so that you understand it. The two outside parts, he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. That's the good news. The poor are the poor in spirit. And the part that's at the end that balances that. And to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. This is the year when God is showing favor. He will forgive your sins. He will pardon your iniquity. You can come back into full relationship with God and have this peace with God. So those are the two outside parts. Now we're going to go into the middle parts. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives, to set free those who are oppressed. And this is spiritual oppression. This is coming back to binding the strong man and releasing the people. Uh, this is not, oh, I'm so tired after my eight hours of work. So when Jesus says, come to me, all you who are heavy laden and are burdened, and I will give you rest. This is what he's talking about. It's spiritual release. And in the middle, the middle part, where, where the whole thing hinges, and recovery of sight 
to the blind. So when you see yourself before God as a sinner with this burden of guilt and shame and looking into a Christless eternity of hell, when your eyes are finally open, just as Isaiah's was, Isaiah's were in the temple when he saw God holy and uplifted and he saw his sin. His eyes were opened. He had sight. The blind could, could see. Then they will see that God offers freely in the gospel the release and the burden. Uh, here are some verses that I found. Luke 1, This is Zechariah speaking about Jesus in prophetic terms. To shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. Luke 2.30 and 32. This is Simeon when he's holding Jesus, who's 40 days old, maybe 41 days old, in his arms, 40, at least 40 days old. My eyes have seen your salvation. Looking at that baby, my eyes have seen your salvation. A light of revelation to the Gentiles. And Jesus himself says, I am the light of the world. And uh, John tells us in the gospel, uh, chapter 1, verse 4, in him was life. And the life was the light of men. Now, that's what Jesus was preaching. And this is what they expected Jesus to say, because he gives the uh, scroll back to the attendant and sits down on the rabbi's chair in front of everybody. And now he's going to... This is what they expected him to, see, to, to, to say. Well, it's good to be back home, guys. Uh, Jacob, is that door that I fixed still working well? And Samuel, what about the plow? Is it still okay? Yeah, oh, great. Listen, what you heard about my work in Capernaum, it's a little exaggerated, okay? Listen, we just read this stuff about the, the, the Messiah coming. Isn't it great that God's sending a Messiah? Let's just all stop right now and pray and ask God to send the Messiah soon so we can enjoy all these blessings. Now, that's what they expected him to say. But what did he actually say? Listen to what he says. So he just hands this back. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is what it says. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And he has sent me to proclaim, I am that Messiah. And they went berserk. That was a slap in the face. They were shocked at his preaching. They just couldn't fathom it. They, they, they said, this guy, this message, they were used to good preaching because they had the Old Testament scriptures. They were used to wisdom because they had the Bible. I mean, Solomon and his famous wisdom. Joseph in Egypt, the Pharaoh said, wow, you got wisdom I'd never heard of. All of this wisdom, and here comes Jesus, and he's saying things that only God could say. You know, Jesus says shocking things. I just want you to feel, just as if I were saying this right now. What if I said to you, hey, you know, all the false religions of the world, all the religions of the world are all false except anybody who comes to me. Only if you come to me, you'll get to God. What would you think about that? Or if I said to you, hey, before Abraham was, I am, that's Yahweh. What would you think about that? Or if I said to you, God, the Father, and I are one. What would you think about that? Would you, uh, you, know. <laughs> you would, wouldn't you? They were stunned and shocked at his preaching. But Jesus is preaching a message of salvation to these people. He was offering them spiritual restitution so they could get back into fellowship with God. He was God incarnate, the Messiah, coming to them to bring them the good news. And he quotes it out of Isaiah. He was coming to bring them moral transformation. In other words, to change their lives, to change their whole way of being, their desires, what he calls the spiritual birth, a new birth from heaven. And he was also offering them freedom and liberty from shame and guilt and spiritual oppression so that they could walk in the light of God. That was wonderful. But they turned him down because the preaching of Jesus revealed their sin. 
All right, so let's go from the Nazarenes were shocked at his preaching to the second point. The Nazarenes stumbled over his person. Uh, this is in three and four. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joses, Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense of him. And that's the word, stumble. Offense is the word stumble. The Greek word for offense is scandalon, which is like the English word scandal. Uh, they, the, uh, and the word scandal means to stumble over or to cause to offend or to put a snare in your way. And so Jesus coming there, they looked at him and they stumbled over him because he was a local boy. You know, I, I've thought about this many times. Okay, how many sleep in the bed with their parents when they were little? Anybody sleep with their parents in bed when you're all your, all, all, your whole time or just one time? Just, just, just a few times. The standard practice in Christ's day is that the mother and father slept in the middle of the bed and the girls on one side and the boys on the other. They didn't have a whole lot of room. When you have 10 kids, you can't have 10 single beds. <laughs> so that's how mostly as it was done. And uh, some of these brothers, uh, you know, actually were sleeping in bed with Jesus. How do you sleep with God in bed for, you know, all that time? How do you live with God in the flesh for about 28 years? My guess is that he went to Egypt when he was um, about a year old, maybe, maybe six months, but no, for sure no more than two years old. So he goes up to Nazareth, no, no older than two years old, and he starts his ministry at 30. So it's about 28 years he's living with you. How do you live with God for 28 years? And still not figure him out. See, he was just a local boy. Uh, and, and it says he is the carpenter. Um, now, when we think of carpenter, we think of people like Pero, you know, excellent woodworkers and strictly working with wood. Uh, the Greek word for carpenter is tekton, from which we get our English word technet, technician or architect. An architect is the guy who begins the work, tekt. Is, is the, so a better translation, uh, don't think of Jesus as strictly a woodworker. A better translation would be a builder, a craftsman, uh, a handyman. Uh, if you think of the houses in, in, in those days, what were the houses mostly made of? Stone, right? Very little wood. The only wood they had was for the door, for the roof, and the little bit of furniture they had in the house. So Jesus couldn't have made a living in Nazareth working with wood. There was just no, he, he couldn't have fed his family. By this point, we assume that Joseph is dead, has died, because he, Jesus is now the carpenter. So uh, Jesus learned the trade of his father. He took over the family business, as it were. And so he's gone around. He's now carrying the weight of the shoulder, on his shoulders, the weight of the family. Uh, so he understands what it's like to have a family. So he's feeding Mary, his four brothers, and at least two sisters. So that's seven mouths that he has to feed, uh, plus his own. So that's a lot of people that he was responsible for. So he understands the burden. And he was living in Nazareth, and as I said, more than likely he went down to Sephora to work. You know that parable where he says the guy went there, and uh, at 9 o'clock in the morning he came and he grabbed a few workers from the marketplace, and then at 11 o'clock, and then at three, 1 o'clock, and 3 o'clock, and 5 o'clock. I believe that that was a story of Jesus himself, that he often went down to Sephora into the main square waiting for somebody to hire him so he could work for the day to feed his family. Uh, so so, he, so they, these people, they grew up with Jesus. He was just a local boy. And, and, and he's now the Messiah? Are you kidding me? It can't be. So that's the first thing. Uh, it's not just the carpenter. Now, we come to Son of Mary. Now, Son of Mary is a slap in the face because in biblical times, you were always the son of the Father. The, the fact that he's called the son of Mary here is, there, is, 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 is there, they're making fun of him. And it's probably, now the scriptures don't say this, but it's probably because these people, remember, they're all from Nazareth. Mary and Joseph were engaged. Mary went down to see Elizabeth. She came back and she started the show. Right? I'm not going to say, I know some ladies in our church, when they started to have babies, Rose included, wanted nobody to know. 
And uh, I was told by some of the other ladies of the church, the men may not see what the women do. They can tell immediately. <laughs> and when Mary came back, it was so obvious that even Joseph saw. So everybody figured it out. Mm -hmm. Joseph did the honorable thing. Yep, he took care of Mary and made her a respectable woman. And this Jesus, yep, there's always a cloud over Jesus and his birth. In fact, in the gospel, uh, gospel of John, it's the, 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 high, the, 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 the Pharisees and the scribes say to Jesus, we were not born of fornication. There's a subtle dig there. And in chapter 9, they say, we know where Moses came from, but this man, we don't know where he came from. There's another subtle dig. And so always there's this cloud over the birth of Jesus. Now, I don't think Joseph and Mary said, oh, hey, listen, let me, let me explain this. You remember Gabriel, the angel Gabriel? Yeah, uh, it's the Holy Spirit. You know how much that would have been believed. I think that they just swallowed it. And so he is the son of Mary. And here's the second part. He's the brother of James. Now, Joses, Joses is another Greek translation of Joseph. Uh, you know, in English, we have William and Bill or Robert and Bob. So in Greek, Joseph into Greek came out as, as Joseph, and sometimes it came out as Joseph. So this is just another way of saying uh, Joseph. So from now on, I'm going to call him Joseph. Uh, James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, his brothers, and his sisters, are they not all here with us? So at this point in their lives, these sisters are more than likely married. And in their husband's home. And the fact that it says, are they not here with us? Now, doesn't mean with us like in the neighborhood. With us means they think as we think. They, they think the same thing about Jesus. I mean, he's been with us all of his life. We didn't know he was the Messiah. We can't do the kinds of things that he does. We don't preach the way he does. We don't do miracles. He's just a local boy. I think he's lost his mind. Can you see now from chapter 3, they've lost his mind? So all of these things, they're stumbling over his, over his person. They refuse to bend their knee to Jesus because he's just the local handyman, right? We read of people that fall at Jesus' knee all the time. Not here, but all through scriptures, we read of people falling at Christ's knee. And let me tell you a secret if you don't know this. Every single human being on the face of the earth, ever born and ever will be born, every one of us are all going to kneel at Jesus on the last day. Every tongue will confess and every knee will bow. They will find out then that Jesus is Lord. Here, they wouldn't do it because he was just a local boy. And they just couldn't fathom it. They just stumbled over his person. Here's a parenthesis. I'm just going to throw this in. I'm not going to develop it. I'm going to give it to you for free because it's my job to teach the scripture. It's not my job to kick other religions in the teeth. I have no interest in doing that. I just want to make sure that this is what people understand from scripture. There is a religion and a belief popular today that says that Mary was a perpetual virgin, that she never had any other children after Jesus. Uh, and uh, they say that this is either children from Joseph before in another marriage or cousins. Well, this text really would destroy that whole argument. Uh, you could say cousins if you want, but nobody puts mother, brothers, and sisters together in the same sentence. If I said to you, my mother, my brother, and my sister are coming to my house, you wouldn't go home and say, hey, the pastor's mother, his cousin, and his sister is coming to the house. And even the sister is not a sister. She's a cousin, too. <laughs> you know, I mean, people don't make that kind of stuff. So to, to, take, to have that doctrine is not to take it from the scriptures. Where, where they get it, I don't know. So they've stumbled over Jesus. And Jesus says to them, now this is the quote, a prophet is not without honor except, and notice he's, he starts off wide and he gets narrower and narrower, except in his own hometown, among his own relatives, and those of his own household, because these are the people that know him the best. Uh, you know, you live with Jesus all his life, 28 years. God in the flesh, 
He's never done us anything wrong. He's always had these gracious words. He's always been helpful. And yet, they, had, they, they couldn't see him. And uh, so it's without honor. And so what Jesus is saying, the problem is not with me, it's with you. There's no, there's no faith in you. I'm not the problem. You're the problem because you refuse to see. All right, the third point is five and six. And the Nazarenes stymie or stop the power of Christ's miracles. He could do no miracle there except he laid his hands on a few sick people. Faith is powerful, but so is unbelief, non-faith. Uh, here, we see that Jesus doesn't do miracles because he doesn't have the power. Oh, I'm exhausted. I can't go on. He doesn't do any miracles because they won't let him. They won't accept them. It's not that God doesn't have the power. It's that they don't have the faith. And I just want to repeat again, faith is just not that empty belief that if you positive think something, it'll happen. Like, for example, tomorrow I'm going to find a billion dollars as soon as I step out my front door. Now, I absolutely believe that. And it would one of you please go put that billion dollars there so I can find it so my faith will work, right? I mean, can, can I re go home? Can you pray for me that I'll find that billion dollars outside my... I can believe it and believe it and believe it. But that's not going to make the billion dollars up here on my front step tomorrow morning, right? So what faith is, is faith is like the grappling hook that you throw it up. And if it grabs onto something that's solid, then you can climb it because it's what's solid that's holding it. And so if your faith is placed in anything except God, it'll come crashing down on you. If your faith is in God, in Christ, then you're secure no matter how weak or how small that faith is. And I've likened it to a person walking up a long, long ladder on a wall. If you struggle up that ladder all your life and get to the very top, isn't it a tragedy if you found you put the ladder on the wrong wall? You had to have the ladder on that wall. <laughs> and Jesus is the right wall, the only wall. No one can go to God except through Christ. He says that clearly. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to God except through me. Jesus says, if you put my words to the test, you will see if I speak from God or not. And Peter says, there is absolutely no name given under heaven that's given by God, except the name of Jesus, whereby we must be saved. So they didn't have, and because of that, they stymied, stopped the power of Jesus. Here's the other thing that I got of this. That Jesus was more willing to heal than they were to be healed. God is more willing to give than we are to receive. Psalm 81.10 says this, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. And a lot of people go to the fountain and bitterly complain that they have very little in their hands because their cup was the size of a thimble and they blame the fountain. Had they brought a wash bucket, they would have gone home with a lot more. The fountain wasn't the problem. It was the thimble that they were bringing to the fountain. God has greater desire to give than people have to receive. And then they blame God. Here's the third thing I picked out of this. Notice that uh, Jesus was astonished at their lack of faith. Now, this is the mystery of the incarnation. Uh, Jesus is at the same time God and a human being. And uh, the human Jesus was shocked. He had just finished reading Isaiah 61 to them. They had all the testimonies of all of the miraculous, powerful works that he had done. And they wanted to see more. And they didn't believe. Now, faith, as I said, you know, the grappling hook is very powerful. But so is unfaith, non-belief. Let me give you a couple of examples. Adam and Eve, one unfaithful moment, chose to listen to serpent, his lies, 
and took the fruit, the forbidden fruit, and sent all of us, the whole human race, under sin. The Israelites, walking through the desert, going to the promised land, got to the gate of the promised land. Moses sends in the 12 spies so they could see this great land that God was giving them. They got weak knees and came back and said, oh, oh, we can't go in there. You know, they're giants. We're just like up to their toenails. I mean, oh, oh, oh no, 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 no. God, I mean, forget the Egyptians. And so they turned all of Israel back. And God said, all right, 40 years wandering in the wilderness. One a year for each day they were in there. That unfaith. 722 and 586 BC, Israel goes into exile because for about 400 years they were idolatrous. God sent wave after wave after wave of prophets to call them back and they refused. Unfaithfulness. And they went into exile. Unfaithfulness to the teaching of the gospel will send you into a Christless eternity forever, where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus marveled at their lack of faith. I can only talk about the two great examples of faith that Jesus marveled at as well. The centurion, who happened to be Italian, uh, uh, Roman, uh, he, uh, he, he had a servant that was sick. His friends sent to Jesus, look, could you please come? I mean, he built our synagogue. He's a nice guy. He deserves it. You know, he's worthy of this. And Jesus, yeah, sure, I'll go to his house. And on his way, the centurion hears about it and says, stop, look, I'm under authority. If my uh, superiors say, come or go, I come or go. And I have people under me. If I say to them, come or go, they come and go too. I know what authority is all about. Look, you are the commanding general. You don't even have to come. Just say the word. Jesus was amazed. Wow. He figured it out. The, one I, the other one I love is the Syrophoenician woman. Uh, she's up uh, near Tyre. And uh, she says to Jesus, hey, my daughters, she's got this evil spirit. Can you please come? And Jesus, to test her faith, says, uh, you know, look, the children have to eat first, right? It's not fair to stop the kids from eating and, and feed, the, feed the puppies that are under the table. And she said, yeah, you're right, Lord. Of course, the kids have to eat first. But if the, ki if the puppies get the crumbs that fall from the table, you're not stopping. You're not, you're not changing anything. The puppies are just enjoying what the, uh, the blessings are, because you got more than enough. And Jesus was amazed at her face. Look, go home. She's completely cured. Isn't that amazing? She figured it out. She saw Jesus, the, the, uh, the, the thief on the cross. He, the, here was this bloody mess nailed to a cross, and he suddenly sees in that bloody mess nailed to the cross the sovereign ruling king. And he says, when you enter into your kingdom, remember me. And Jesus says, today, you're going to be in my... That's faith. So, so Jesus marvels at this faith. And he also marveled at their faith. <clears throat> well, let me ask you. Are you shocked or stunned when Jesus says that he's the only way to heaven and that you're a sinner and you can't get there without him? Do you stumble over the fact that he was a carpenter, a poor person? He walked on this earth for 30 years and had to be nailed to a cross? Or are you like these people here with lack of faith and don't allow God to work? Our Father and our God, we thank you that Jesus is Lord, but thank you that he has a heart of compassion and that he went to his hometown to bring them the gospel in spite of what they tried to do to him in chapter 3. Thank you that you are more willing to give than we are to receive, and thank you that by your grace we can be saved and eternally at home with you, enjoying the light of life. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's stand together to sing number 577. Number 577 in times like these. Yeah. 
Gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that if there is anyone here today that is without Christ, that you'd work on their heart, that their eyes would be open to see, to see Jesus, and that they by faith would run to Christ and believe and be saved. We thank you that in the times that we live in, in the hard times that we go through, that you are with us through it all, and that we can look to you and we can look to Jesus and know that we have a Savior we have salvation we have life eternal that we will never die if we have Jesus Christ and we thank you for that let us carry the light we pray and blessings upon us we pray be with us in Jesus name amen you are dismissed this morning thank you